Hello class, this is Dr. Palmer again, and today we're going to be looking at interest groups. This would be chapter 11 in our books, and we're uh, a little out of order, but uh, here's our objectives. We're going to describe the role of interest groups in American politics. We're going to compare and contrast the theories of pluralism, elitism, and hyperpluralism. We're going to analyze the factors that make some interest groups more successful than others in the political arena. We're going to assess the four basic strategies that interest groups use to try to shape policy. We'll identify the various types of interest groups and their policy concerns. And we will evaluate how well Madison's ideas for controlling the influence of interest groups have worked in actual practice. Although voter, voter turnout has declined substantially in the U.S. since the 1960s, the number of interest groups in the United States has been increasing rapidly over the past half century. In 1959, there were about 6,000 groups. By 2009, the Encyclopedia of Associations listed about 25,000 groups. This chapter examines this growth and the activities of interest groups, why individuals join groups, and what groups get from their efforts. An interest group is an organization of people with similar policy goals that tries to influence the political process to try to achieve those goals. In so doing, interest groups try to influence every branch and every level of government. This multiplicity of policy arenas helps distinguish interest groups from political parties. Interest groups may also support candidates for office, but American interest groups do not run their own slate of candidates. Interest groups are often policy specialists, whereas parties are policy generalists. Thus, interest groups do not face the constraint imposed by trying to appeal to everyone, unlike political parties. Please complete the following quiz in the EDU system. Theories of Interest Group Politics Understanding the debate over whether honest lobbying creates problems requires an examination of three important theories. One, pluralist theory, argues that interest group activity brings representation to all groups as, to all as groups compete and counterbalance one another. Two, elite theory, argues that a few groups, mostly the wealthy, have most of the power. And three, hyperpluralist theory, asserts that too many groups are getting too much of what they want, resulting in a government policy that is often contradictory and lacking in direction. According to pluralist theory, groups win some and lose some, but no group wins or loses all the time. Pluralists do not deny that some groups are stronger than others or that competing interests do not always get an equal hearing, but they argue that lobbying is open to all and should not be regarded as a problem. No one group is likely to become too dominant and all legitimate groups are able to affect public policy. Elite theorists maintain that real power is held by relatively few people, key groups and institutions. Government is run by a few big interests looking out for themselves. Interest groups are extremely unequal in power. Thus, the preponderance of power held by elites means that pluralist theory does not accurately describe the reality of American politics. This chapter also explores hyperpluralism and interest group liberalism. Theodore Lowy coined the phrase interest group liberalism to refer to the government's excessive deference to groups. 
Interest group liberalism holds that virtually all pressure group demands are legitimate and that the job of the government is to advance them all. In an effort to appease every interest, government agencies proliferate, conflicting regulations expand, programs multiply, and the budget skyrocket, skyrockets. Interest group liberalism is promoted by the network of sub-governments, also known as iron triangles. These sub-governments are composed of key interest groups interested in a particular policy, the government agency in charge of administering the policy, and the members of congressional committees and subcommittees handling the policy. Relations between groups and the government become too cozy. Hard choices about national policy rarely get made as the government tries to favor all groups, leading to policy paralysis. Hyperpluralist theory often points to government's contradictory tobacco-related policies as an example of interest group liberalism. In this table we see the power of 25, uh, the power 25. Um, in order to rank lobbying associations according to their power, Fortune asks members of Congress, prominent congressional staffers, senior White House aides, and top ranking officials of the largest lobbying groups in Washington to, ass Washington to assess on a scale of 0 to 100 the political cloud of 87 major trade associations, labor unions, and interest groups. Here's the list of the groups that finished in the top 25. What makes an interest group successful? Many factors affect the success of an interest group, including the size of the group, the intensity, and its financial resources. Small groups actually have organizational advantages over large groups. A potential group is composed of all people who might be group members because they share some common interest. An actual group is composed of those in the potential group who choose to join. Groups vary enormously in the degree to which they enroll their potential membership. A collective good is something of value, such as clean air or higher minimum wage, that cannot be withheld from a potential group member. Members of the potential group share in benefits that members of the actual group work to secure. The free rider program uh, problem occurs when potential members decide not to join but to sit back and let the others do the work from which there will nonetheless be benefit. According to Olson's law of large groups, the bigger the group, the more serious the free rider prob problem. The primary way for large potential groups to overcome Olson's law is to provide attractive benefits for those for only those who join the organization. Selective benefits are goods that a group can redirect to those who pay their yearly dues, such as information publications, travel discounts, and group insurance rates. One way a large potential group may be mobilized is through an issue about which people feel intensely, such as abortion. Both small and large groups enjoy a psychological advantage when intensity is involved. Politicians are more likely to listen when a group shows that it cares deeply about an issue, and many votes may be won or lost on a single issue. One of the biggest indictments of the interest group system is that it is biased towards the wealthy. Critics charge that PACs, political action committees, uh, as the source of so much money in today's expensive high-tech campaigns, distorts the governmental process in favor of those who can raise the most money. Conversely, the big interests do not always win, even on some of the most important issues, such as the Tax Reform Act of 1986. How groups try to change or shape policy. The three traditional tr strategies of interest groups are lobbying, electioneering, and litigation. In addition, groups have recently developed a variety of sophisticated techniques to appeal to the public for widespread support. Lobbyists are political persuaders who are the representatives of organized groups. They normally work in Washington handling groups' legislative business. Although lobbyists primarily try to influence 
members of Congress, Congress, they can also be of help to them. For example, lobbyists are an important source of specialized information. Political scientists are not in agreement about the effectiveness of lobbying. Much evidence suggests that lobbyists' power over policy is often exaggerated, but plenty of evidence to the contrary suggests that lobbying can sometimes persuade legislators to support a certain policy. It is difficult to evaluate the specific effects of lobbying because it's hard to isolate its effects from other influences. Like campaigning, lobbying is directed primarily towards activating and reinforcing one's supporters. Example of um, the effect that lobbying can sometimes persuade legislatures to support a certain policy include the opposition to gun control legislation by the National Rifle Association and intense lobbying against the 1988 Catastrophic Health Care Act conducted by the nation's most wealthy senior citizens. It's difficult to evaluate the specific effects of lobbying again because it's hard to isolate its, its, its effects from other influences. For years, the National Rifle Association has successfully lobbied against gun control measures, arguing that the Second Amendment to the Constitution guarantees all students, uh, citizens the right to bear arms. Getting the right people into office or keeping them there is another key strategy of interest groups. Many groups therefore get involved in electioneering or aiding candidates financially and getting their members to support them. Political action committees, or PACs, have provided a means for groups to participate in electioneering more than ever before. PACs tend to contribute, uh, contribute the most to incumbents and to the party that holds the majority in Congress. Some PACs are, are particularly influential. In 2004, one quarter of all PAC money came from about 1% of the largest PACs. Today, litigation is often used if an interest group fails in Congress or gets only a vague piece of legislation. Environmental legislation, such as the Clean Air Act, typically includes written provisions allowing ordinary citizens to sue for enforcement. Possibly the most famous interest group victories in court were by civil rights groups in the 1950s. These groups won major victories in court cases concerning school desegregation, equal housing, and labor market equality. Consumer groups have also used suits against businesses and federal agencies as a means of enforcing consumer regulations. One tactic that lawyers employ to make the views of interest groups heard by the judiciary is the filing of amicus curare, or friend of court briefs. A more direct judicial strategy employed by interest groups is the filing of class action lawsuits, which enable a group of people in a similar situation to combine their common grievances into a single uh, suit. The practice of interest groups appealing to the public for support has a long tradition in American politics. Public opinion ultimately makes its way to policymakers, so interest groups carefully cultivate their public image. Interest groups spend over 100 million appealing to public opinion during the debate over the Health Care uh, Act in 1994. Types of interest groups. Political scientists loosely characterize interest groups into four main policy areas. Some deal primarily with economic issues, other with issues of the environment, others with equality issues, and still others with interests of all consumers. Business groups are ultimately concerned with wages, prices, and profits. In the American economy, government does not directly uh, determine these factors. More commonly, 
public policy in America has economic effects through regulations, tax advantages, subsidies and contracts, and international trade policy. Business, labor, and farmers all worry about government regulations. Every economic group wants to get its share of direct aid and government contracts. Business groups have supported right-to-work laws which outlaw union membership as a condition of employment. In 1947, Congress passed the Taft-Hartley Act, permitting states to adopt right-to-work laws. The American labor movement reached its peak in 1956 when 33% of the non-agricultural workforce belonged to a union. The percentage has declined since then to about 16%. 70% of all interest group organizations have a Washington presence uh, that represent business, and business PACs have increased more dramatically than any other category of PACs. Most large firms now have offices in Washington. Business interests are generally unified when it comes to promoting greater profits, but are often fragmented when policy choices have to be made. Two umbrella organizations, the National Association of Manufacturers and the Chamber of Commerce, include most corporations and businesses and speak for them when general business interests are at stake. The hundreds of trade and product associations fight regulations that would reduce their profits. They seek preferential tax treatment as well as governmental subsidies and contracts. It is not only American trade associations that are concerned with policies such as tariffs and preferential tax treatment foreign corporations and governments are also concerned. Environmental interests have exerted a great deal of influence on Congress and state legislatures. These groups have promoted pollution control policies, wilderness protection, animal rights, and population control. A few environmental groups like the Sierra Club and the Audubon Society have been around since the 19th century, but many others trace their origins to the first Earth Day in 1970, when ecology-minded people marched to symbolize their support for envi environmental protection. Group politics intensifies when two public interests class, such as environmental protection and ensuring the supply of energy. Environmentalists insist that in the long run, energy supplies can be insured without harming the environment or risking radiation exposure, f exposure from nuclear plants. Energy producers argue that our environmentalists oppose nearly all new energy projects. They argue that some limited risks have to be taken to fulfill energy demands. Environmental lobbies have been successful in preventing the building of any new nuclear power plants for the last 30 years. Equality interests are those groups representing minorities and women who make equal rights their main policy goal. Equality at the polls, in housing, on the job, in education, and in all other facets of American life has long been the dominant goal of African American groups the oldest of which is the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, NAACP. The 19th Amendment in 1920 guaranteed women the right to vote, but other guarantees of equal protection for women remain absent from the Constitution. More recently, women's rights groups such as the National Organization of Women, NOW, have lobbied for an end to sexual discrimination. NOW's primary goal has been the passage of the Equal Rights Amendment. The ERA was approved by Congress in 1972, but fell three states short of the 38 necessary for ratification. Interest groups such as Phyllis Shafley's Eagle Forum battled NOW and other women's groups over ratification of the ERA. NOW remains committed to enacting the protection of the ERA, uh, the protections that the ERA would have constitutionally guaranteed by advocating the enactment of many individual statutes. Consumer and public interest lobbies, representing that champion, 
representing groups that champion causes or ideas, quote, in the public interest, are organizations that seek a collective good by which everyone should be better off, regardless of whether they joined in the lobbying. Consumer groups have won many legislative victories in recent years, including the creation in 1973 of the Consumer Pro Product Safety Commission, authorized to regulate all consumer products and to ban particularly dangerous ones. Other public interest groups include groups that speak for those who cannot speak for themselves, such as children, animals, and the mentally ill, good government uh, groups such as common cause, religious groups, and environmental groups. The consumer movement was spurred by Ralph Nader, who was propelled to national prominence by his book Unsafe at Any Speed, which attacked the safety of General Motors' Corvair. Nader successfully sued General Motors for invasion of privacy after GM hired a private detective to dig into his background and follow him around. He used the proceeds from the damaged settlement to launch the first major consumer group in Washington, D.C. Consumer groups have won many legislative victories in recent years, including the creation in 1973 of the Consumer Product Safety Commission. Understanding Interest Groups The problem of interest groups in America today remains much, as the, much the same as James Madison defined it over 200 years ago. A free society must allow for the representation of all groups, yet groups are usually more concerned with their own self-interest than with the needs of the society as a whole. For democracy to work well, it is important that self-interested groups not be allowed to assume a dominant position. Madison's solution was to create an open system in which many groups would be able to participate. Groups with opposing interests would counterbalance each other. Pluralist theorists believe that a rough approximation of the public interest emerges through this competition. Elite theorists point to the proliferation of business PACs as evidence of more interest group corruption in American politics than ever. They particularly note that wealthier interests are greatly advanced by the PAC system. Hyperpluralist theory theorists feel that government attempts to accommodate all major interest groups lead to policy gridlock and the inability for government to initiate major policies. The power of special interest groups through PACs and other means has implications for the scope of government. Most special interest groups strive to maintain established programs that benefit them and thus promote larger government. Conversely, one can make the argument that the growth of the scope of government in recent decades accounts for a good portion of the proliferation of interest groups. As the federal government has become involved in more areas, more interest groups have arisen to influence policy.